שלום אבריבדי, וחג פסח שמח. I'd like to tell you about a fabulous new publication for the Pesach. This year I wanted to enrich your Pesach Seder in another dimension. So I sat down, I wrote many of the tradition that I was raised up in, and I put it into a new publication called The Hidden Mashiach in Agadat Pesach. This is a fabulous publication. publication that will bring the center to life in a new dimension as we are in these 15 step quests to find the Jewish Messiah so I invite you to go to our Amazon store and to download the hidden Mashiach in Agadat Pesach I pray that Messiah will reveal himself to you to your family and it will be the guest of honor in Israel the Pesach Seder this year. God bless you, and let's go and find the Messiah this Pesach. Shalom, chaverim, and welcome to this special shiur called the Mystery of the Agadah. As you probably heard, we have decided to release to the world, completely free of charge, a new Messianic Agadah, a publication as important as our Ahavat Olam Sidur and the return of the kosher pig. that point the way to Messiah, to the word of our rabbis and to the word of the Agadah in a way that will make you shout in joy, hallelujah, as you go through this Passover Seder. We are asking you today to do something special. Yes, the Agadah is completely free of charge. As it says in the Agadah itself, come and eat all the who are hungry. Many of you are hungry and thirsty today. And as an organization, we decide to open the door and our storehouse to you. If you are blessed by the Agada, go download it, but also consider, please consider supporting this project as thousands of upon thousands of dollars have been poured into this project by so many people who are heroes of the faith. So please help us to continue to spread the good news through the Jewishness of the Messiah, through the messianic theme in things like this Passover, Seder, the Haggadah, the things that highlight the nature of our Messiah, Yeshua. Thank you for your generosity. I hope that both our teachings on Passover will be a blessing to you and everything that is being given to you, you will be able to give 10 and 100 fold back. Remember, nobody is to come empty-handed to the house of the Lord in the Pesach. So whatever you can give, give. And if you can't give, well, it's our joy to give to you. Chag Sameach and enjoy these teachings. Shalom, chaverim. Chag Sameach to all of you who watch this program today in preparation for uh, Passover titled The Mystery of the Agadah. I know that um, many of you, many, many, many of you are preparing in preparation, in preparation mode for uh, Passover right now. And I wanted to give you a prophetic eye view today in this special teaching on uh, Passover specifically as related to the story of the Agadah. 
Everybody know about the elements. Everybody know about the ten plagues. Everybody know the story. But what I want to do with you today is to share with you the story that is behind the story, if it makes sense to you. We read this story and we ask the question, how is this night different from any other night? Well, I want to try to answer this to you today through the word of our sages, the word of Chazal as we know them as, the words of our rabbis, and to try to understand what is behind the story of the Haggadah. Let me start by first suggesting to you that the entire theme of this book that I hold here in my hand, the, the Haggadah, okay, here is a traditional Haggadah Le Pesach, the entire story here is a story of redemption. Okay, let's, let's start with this. It's a, it's a true story of redemption. And if we look carefully and deeply at some of the steps and some of the clues that left to us in the Agadah by our sages, we will find uh, very clearly uh, not just the Messiah of Israel, but we also find the redemption, eschatology, etc., etc. And a matter of fact, in Talmud Bavli, uh, Rosh Hashanah Tractate, uh, chapter 11, verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 11, page, page 11, uh, uh, Masechet, page 11, Aleph, it says the following. It says, on the new year, the bondage of our ancestors in Egypt ceased. In Nisan they were redeemed, and Nisan they will be redeemed in the time to come, Rabbi Yeshua says. In Nisan the world was created. In Nisan Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were born. In Nisan they died. On Passover, Isaac was born. On New Year, Sarah, Rachel, Hannah were visited. On New Year, Yosef went forward to prison. On New Year, the bondage of our ancestors ceased in Egypt. And in Nisan, they will be redeemed in the time to come. There is um, two schools of thoughts in Judaism that when we talk about redemption. One school of thought says that the redemption will occur in the month of Nisan. Another school of thought says that the redemption will happen actually in the month of Tishrei. For the majority though uh, of Jewish thought, the redemption will happen in Nisan. When I'm talking about the redemption, I'm talking about the fa final redemption because our sages explain to us that a redemption, the process of a redemption is a cyclical process as a rather than a linear process. What has happened will happen again. Exodus Rabbah 2 says to us, everything that has happened in the first Geulah, when we went forward out of Egypt, going to happen again, but it's going to happen in a much more magnified way. Okay, so in essence, if we can take the story of the Haggadah, based on the word of the sages, if we can take this story and study it carefully, we can learn the clues and the steps of the future, future redemption, okay? There is even a clue in the Hebrew word Haggadah, the name of the story that we're telling. It's not called in Hebrew a story. It's called in Hebrew Haggadah, and it's based on the verse, and if you want to make yourself a note, the verse from Shemot 12.8 that says, And you are to tell your child in that day, in that day, notice also in the language here, okay? It says in Zechariah, talking about God, he says, and we sing it every Shabbat in the synagogue, In that day the Lord will be one and His name will be one. In essence, we are to tell the story of Agada for our children over and over and over again for one purpose, to prepare them to the day of redemption, the day of redemption that is coming in 
in the future. That's kind of the reason we're telling the story. This story, the story called the Haggadah, represent a rehearsal of some sort, okay? Now, the word of Haggadah, where's this name Haggadah, where's that come from, is also uh, interesting. Chazal explained to us that the word Haggadah re related to the idea of being drawing, drawing near to God, drawing near to Him, coming close to Him, okay? It's like, like, da like, like, like David the Melech, he cried up, and you see this term Haggadah actually uses, people don't realize that, but the term Haggadah, is an issue of a heart. It's not an issue of sitting down and, hey, let's read a happy story. And I hope that tomorrow it won't be just a social gathering for you. It will be an event that, as Chazal says, it is your commandment to act in this day as you live in Egypt today. And matter of fact, look at what King David said. Kavida Melech said in Psalm 51, he says, and we sing it every Shabbat. Adonai sefatahati yiftach ufi agitehi latecha. It's actually coming from uh, the Amidah, the beginning of the Amidah, the Avot section. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare thy praise. I want you to notice here the word shall declare. You see this term declare? The term declare in Hebrew is the term yagid. The term yagid is derived from the same word Haggadah. And look what God, what David is crying out. He said, God opened my lips so I will be able to, 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 to proclaim. As the scriptures say, out of a bundle of the heart, the mouth speaks. So there is an element here, even in the term, the term Agadah, there is an element of the heart connecting our heart with the heart of God. Now I want to shock you for a moment and explain to you here today that the story of the Agadah is not the story merely of Exodus. If you think that the story of Agadah is about our redemption out of Exodus, I want to tell you that this is truly only a very, very small part of the story that I would like to reveal to you today. The real story of Agadah has to deal with humankind, mankind, and what took place actually in the garden, okay? It's a process, as you're going to learn with me today, in the rectification of mankind back to the original garden condition. Let me explain this just a little bit more. There is definitely a controversy uh, uh, in Judaism about what fruit Adam actually ate uh, in the garden, okay? Some say that he ate the fruit of the vine. In rabbinical literature, you're going to find a couple of these. Some say he ate the fruit of the vine. Some say he ate wheat, and some say he ate from a fig tree, and some say he ate from an etrog tree. Interesting, all of those things are represented by the different festivals, okay? Since we do not know exactly which fruit Adam ate f from. I want you to notice that each one of those things that I just mentioned to you is part of the Passover Seder. It should give you a real clue for what the Passover Seder is really all about, okay? So, for example, the sages teach that when we drink, you know, the Seder start with the first cup of wine that is called Kadesh, or we call it in Hebrew, the Kiddush, right? The cup of sanctification. What is the first thing we do? The sages explain that the cup of Kiddush, what we do in the entire Agatha story, we do what's called a Tikkun, repair or restoration. And what are we repairing through the very first cup of Kiddush? 
When tomorrow when you raise the cup and you read, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Priya Gefen, please understand that this mitzvah, in theory, according to Chazal, it's a mitzvah that we proclaim to bring a tikkun for this first sin in the Garden of Eden, okay? If Adam indeed ate vine, as Chazal says, they say, we start with the fruit of the vine, we're making a tikkun for the sin of Adam. In essence, we said to God, God, we want you to bring it out of spiritual Egypt, we want you to restore us back to our original condition, okay? Wine, uh, vine, you know, since there is a question of what wheat also they ate, guess what? We also eat in, in the Pesach says Seder tomorrow a matzah. Again, what is that represent? A tikkun for what Adam has done. In essence, we are saying we want to be repaired and we want to be restored to what Adam was not ab able to do. Notice another thing. Another thing that we eat tomorrow, we also eat a haraset. Now, what haraset is made of? If you know what haraset is made of, the one ingredient of a haraset, okay, that is made from is apple, okay? And, 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 and the word that is used is the word tapuach, okay? Tapuach is represented, it can be both represented, uh, 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 tapuach represents apples, but it also represents an etrog. Again, those are the two things that the rabbi said that Adam, this represents the forbidden fruit, okay? Some people also add figs to the haroset for that exact reason as well. And here's what our sages said. We do those things even in the element of the haroset for one reason. We eat matzah, we eat haroset, we, we, we also drink the first part cup of wine. We do it for one reason or, or only to remove ourselves the original scene of the tree of knowledge. Matter of fact, in Midrash Rabbah, we learned that afterwards, I want to, uh, uh, in Midrash Rabbah, actually, uh, there's a, a very interesting commentary that explained that afterwards, Adam and Eve ate all kind of animals. And that's why we use, according to the secrets, or, or, of the Torah, why we use the lamb for Passover offering, okay? And uh, we eat a cow for fasting offering. It represents the tikkun even for everything that Adam and Eve happened. Let me explain a little bit more. This is, will become clearer. I know some of you have never heard it before, and you think that that the, the story of the Agada is really a story just out about the exodus of the Jewish people. But we need to go back in order to understand it, okay? Here is what Chazal uh, explained to us. They explained to us that during the time before Adam and Eve had seen the Midrash explained to us, the angels, the Malachim, they roasted the meat for Adam, okay? And they chilled this heavenly uh, wine, okay? The Nachash, the serpent, saw this, and he was become jealous on the fact that Adam are shown. Adam, okay? And by the way, without getting into too many details, Adam are shown Adam. It's an acronym, Aleph, Adam, Dalet, David, Mem, Mashiach. It's, 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 it's a picture of Adam, of David and Messiah. Hasatan saw what kind of relationship God going to have with the first man and he said it is impossible because he became jealous and he caused mankind to sin, okay? And that's why in essence, today we are roasting something. It's a memory of the roasting of the Malachim, the angels themselves, that we give in essence, we say, God, we want again, not just to rectify for the sin of Adam, we want again to have this relationship that you give us the food. You see, he gave us the manna and, 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 and the slav and the man later in, in as he took us out of Egypt, but that was just merely a substitution, and if I may say, a cheap substitution to what he has done in 
the garden, okay? Because what he has done in the garden is his desire to return us to. Let me give you another incredible example of those things so we understand the meaning behind the story of the Haggadah. In the, in, the, in the Pesach plate, you go and have a parsley, okay? And, you know, sometimes lettuce. Notice that everything that we eat is green, okay? And people ask the question, why do we eat green? And some people said, well, because it's present life. Well, friend, that's true, that's fine and all, but that's not the real reason, okay? Why do we eat green? Let me shock you. Before Adam have sinned, friends, he was not permitted. Before, before Adam and uh, Eve sinned, he and Eve were not permitted to slaughter animals for food in order to eat them. Since the animal were also what we call metukanim, they were repaired, they were in perfection. Okay? Adam only ate vegetables. He was vegetarian. How do I know it? Because the Torah tells us this. As a matter of fact, look with me for a moment in Bereshit, chapter 1, verse 29. It says there, and you have the Hebrew and the English, I'll read it in Hebrew, I give you it, kol esef zorei hazera, asher al pnei kol haaretz, et kol haetz, asher bo etz, pri etz, zorei hazera, lachem iye leach la. I give you all those, those greens for vegetables, and it will be for your eating pleasure, okay? Please understand that this design that God has for us is not with meat. I'm not, by the way, I love eating meat. Don't get me, don't get me wrong. But that was not God's design. And that's why we eat green in the Passover Sunday. We said, God, we desire today to be returning back to the original condition that you have set us before. And as a matter of fact, that's why we received Torah to begin with. We received the Torah so we will be returning back to the original condition. But something went wrong when we rejected the first set of tablets. And as a matter of fact, the second thing we're doing in the story of the Agada is we do a bracha over the parsley. And I want you to notice what the bracha actually reads like. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Bore Pri Adama. I want you to notice something about the word Adama. The word Adama made up of three root letters. Aleph, Dalet, Ma'am, that's the name of Adam, okay? In essence, there is a clue, linguistic clue here in the world that says, we want to return back to the original condition where Adam was operating that back. Matter of fact, let's bring up the word one more time. The word Adama, Adam, it's Aleph for Adam, Dalet for David, and Ma'am for Mashiach. There is even a clue here of the three layers of Geulah. Adam brought the first Geulah, or he was supposed to bring the first Geulah, and he failed. David was supposed to bring the second Geulah, and he also failed. And it will be the man for Mashiach who will bring the absolute final Geulah to the world, to the world, and that will be the Geulah that we are looking forward. So, in essence, by eating the parsley, we are saying. God restore us back to our original condition. I am I challenge you to walk tomorrow to your Passover Seder with this with this expectation that God is going to transform you from the inside out. It's not just about dipping your 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 uh, food and and eating and having fun. It's a supernatural spiritual condition as God seeks to rectify each one of us back to the original condition. So we talk about the cup, first cup, the Kadesh, the wine, represent basically the, the first food. We talk about the Karpas a little bit, the Karpas is the parsley, but let's dig a little bit deeper to this. You see, the word Karpas, friends, 
Again, Hebrew is such a beautiful and unique language, so you always need to pay attention to it. But the word karpas is derived from two words. The first word, a matter of fact, let me show it to you, put it up for me, is the word kar, which actually means pillow. Karit is easy. And pas mean removal. If you put those two words together, parsley, it's really literally read pillow remove, removal. Now you probably ask yourself the question, what removing the pillow has to do with the karpas and with the future geula uh, 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 dot com. It's related to the verse that state, the loyal have vanished from among men. One who wishes to wear the crown of the Torah, the crown of the king, Chazal explained to us, must put away his pillow. What does that mean? When you dip the karpas, it means you, in essence, surrendering your life to the Lord, and you say, I'm willing to put away my own comfort, okay, my own comfort, in order to receive the comfort that God has for me, but not my own comfort. As a matter of fact, in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, the rabbis explain the karpas like this. He says, this is the way that is becoming for the study of the Torah. Slip upon the ground and, give, and live life of trouble. What does that mean? Sleep upon your gun and live life of trouble? That's how you receive Torah? That's how you receive the crown of Torah? Sound like a recipe for trouble. But Chazal said, no. That's what the Karpas represent, okay? A person should be willing to lay aside his pillows and couches in a spiritual speaking, okay? In order to walk into a life of Torah. In essence, the entire story of the Haggadah is story of God reinventing our DNA back to the DNA that He chooses to, only if we choose to let Him transform us. And what does His DNA look like? His DNA looks like as back as the first Adam. Okay? That's what He wants to transform you to. Notice another thing though interesting about the karpas. The next thing we do, we're going to have a bowl of salt water. And everybody say that we take the bowl of salt water and we dip it twice and we let the, the, the tears drop and it looks like the drop of the Israelites. That's a very nice explanation. But let me please allow me to give you some of the deeper meaning behind the karpas. Okay? The karpas represent the mitzvah, and I hope you all do it. Don't just take it and just dip it a little. The mitzvah says that we have to take the karpas and dip it all the way so your fingers are dipped in the salt and then come up. Chazal spoke in one voice, and they says, the dipping twice represent a person spiritual, listen to this, it's incredible, incredible, spiritual immersion of one body for the purpose of complete purification. One would call it a baptism or mikve or whatever term you want to use, but when you take the parsley, it represents your spiritual death because you're underwater and coming back again with the, the power of resurrection. Now, the rabbis continue and they warn us and they say, one should not be like the person who immerses himself with, a, with impure reptile in his hand, God forbid. In essence, they say, don't be lukewarm, don't just dip it a little bit, dip it all the way as you say, God, I want to die today and I want to be resurrected again today again. The entire story here of the car pass is a story of the resurrection by saying, I don't need the pills, I did not need the comfort. I'm asking God for you to let me die for you and be resurrected again from the dead.
But there is more to this story Chazal explained to us. It is related to the word kar pas. The second word, the word in Hebrew pas, does not just mean removal, but it's come from the Hebrew word pasim. Okay, I wanted to write down this word. It's a very important Hebrew word, the word Pasim. Pasim means stripes. It also mean colors. Let me ask you a question. Who is the one who have worn a garment made out of stripes? Kotonet Pasim in Hebrew. The answer should be very obvious to you. The answer is Yosef or Joseph. In essence, the rabbis connected the dipping of the parsley of or the dipping of the parsley to the scene of selling Yosef and what took place with Yosef. And a matter of fact, the word pasim, pas. The same word we get car pass from, equal in gematria to the term 190. Well, guess what? The term in Hebrew, the end, acharit ayamim, also equal 190. That is, friends, not a coincidence. Notice something about this term, kutonet, pasim also. I want you to notice something. It's made out of two letters, the beginning letter. The first letter, chaf, have two form, regular chaf and final chaf. The letter pay also have a two form, regular pay and final pay. Chazal said that it represents the two comings of the Mashiachs. The Mashiach, son of Joseph, and the Mashiach, Son of David. In essence, when we dip the karpas, we are asking God to bring the Geula and bring in Ben Yosef, who will ultimately will bring Mashiach Ben David. And a matter of fact, Chazal says this in Sefer Amenucha by, by, by uh, Rabbi Menoach. They say, says, let's read it together. This is Halacha. It says this. Ve'anu, and it's so amazing. I want to show you Jewish Halacha. And this has come from Halachot Chametz Matzah, chapter 8, Halacha 2. Then it says, Ve'anu, and we are noagim bachar karpas. We dip the karpas. Zecher, Zecher from the word Zikaron, is a memory La kutonet pasim, to the garment of stripes garment, Shehasa Yaakov, that Yaakov did, Avinu, our father, Le Yosef, okay? Nidgalgel adavar, the things happen, Veyardu avotenu le mitzraim. Stop there, this is very important, I want to explain to you. And then what the rabbi says is, all the calamity of even living and going to Egypt and, and being in slavery in Egypt occurred for one reason, because we sold Joseph to the Goyim. We saw go Joseph. It's a prophetic pic picture of, of that. But here is the shocking part that Rabbi Manoach says. Not only that this is a messianic thing to do, but he says here, he explained the two deepings, the following. Let's go back to Rabbi Manoach. And he says, Kloma, therefore he explained, Shehat Valarishana, the first time we deep, okay? Is, is, is not for the, the, the haroset, zecher lekutonet apasim, okay? And he explained it, enarek mezviyai kutonet apasim. He say, we are doing this, the entire thing is a karpas, we are doing it for one reason, as a remembrance of what happened to Joseph. Friends, the entire thing here is messianic. It is done so we remember what happened to Yosef. As we understand, Mashiach ben Yosef will follow the same thing that Yosef has, has went through. 
Now, Rabbi Ashkenazi, one of our most beloved rabbis in the 16th century, in his book Mahasei Adonai, Chelek Bet, page 23, give another incredible reason why we dip twice, okay? For not, not just for the two Geulot, he explained it like this, you may say, and let's go to Rabbi Ashkenazi and read. After Chazal Bagmara explained, the sages says uh, that, that to do the first Tibul, for this purpose, he explained, he said, we are commanded to do Shnei Tibulim, we dip twice. And he explained, the very first time we dip, and notice something amazing, we don't dip it once, twice, we don't do it. Once, we dip before the meal. And the second one, we will do, we, we explain, the first one we do, explain the reason, he say, Hasibali Yeridatam, the reason for their spiritual decline. And he quoted this verse from the Torah, Vayetvelu, at Akutonet Badam. And they dip the Kutonet, the, the coat, the Pasim, they dip it into blood. In answer, the first, the first time we dip it, okay, represent the sin. It's represent the offense that we have done, okay? But then he explained the second reason, the second dipping during the meal, okay, that we are doing, Okay, he says, speaking about the redemptions of Yosef, uh, of, of Yosef ancestors, okay, and that's happened in Pesach, and it says, Vatavaltem, look, it's using the same term, Vatavaltem, the Tvila, Vatavaltem Badam et Basaf Ve'egata El you put on your doorpost the blood, that's represent the prophetic future redemption of Israel, okay, this is, I, I, I hope you understand it, so let me recap it to you in a simple language so you understand it, the first dipping represents the sin of selling Yosef, okay, messianic picture. The second dipping represents the blood that is covered upon our doorposts. That is, in essence, rectifying this sin. It's a prophetic picture of, of the things to come, the karpas. Now, why do we call the green karpas, you might wonder? You know, I explained to you already, it's part of a re reason, but 600,000 Jewish souls were affected by the sin of Hadam Arishon, the first Adam, and ultimately later on Joseph bro brothers, but it starts with Adam Arishon. They went down to Egypt and they uh, suffered oppressive uh, servant, uh, ser servants, they become servants, okay? This we learn from the word karpas, okay? But notice something else. Why, the rabbi asked, why do we eat deep the carpas in salt water? Because the Egyptian cast the children of the 600,000 in the river. All of them were brought out of the river through the merit of the Mashiach. And who is the Mashiach? The Mashiach is Moses. Some people dip the carpas though. Here is the amazing thing. Are you ready, ready for this? This is... Absolutely shocking. I was raised up in a tradition that we dip in salt water. But Chazal says no. It's through the second dipping that we remember the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. In essence, we were casted into the, to the river and casted out because one tzaddik. Because one tzaddik, if he's a true tzaddik, can atone for the entire generation, as it says. But the rabbis continue, and I, I, I was, my jaw dropped when I saw that, that some people, according to, and I'll give you the, the, the reference, Psachim 114, page Aleph, says that we're not to dip it in salt, we are to dip it, to, and now you understand that the double dipping is a picture of redemption, to dip it in vinegar. 
This simple lights the deeds that were of harsh's vinegar. That's one way to look at this. But another way to look at the dipping, and I hope all of you will do it this year. Dip it in the vinegar. That is a Jewish that, that is a Jewish halacha. You can do salt and to do vinegar. As messianic believers, this issue of vinegar become very clear. You see everything pointing to the Mashiach, shockingly. Look with me at what we read in Matityahu, Matai 27, verse 47 to 49. I want to connect this to you. It says, Now, from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. When some of those standing, they heard it. They began saying, This man is calling for Eliyahu. Right away, one of them ran into the, the, took a sponge. He filled it in the sour wine and put it to the stick and was offering to Yeshua to drink. But the rest was saying, leave him alone. Let's see if Eliyahu will come to save him. I want to explain to you a couple of things about this passage. Now that we understand that this bowl of vinegar, what we are too deep, represent the future redemption of Israel. But before we get there, I want you to notice something else. It says in the text here, and I believe there is a, a cross-reference in, in, uh, in Yohanan as well, but it says here that darkness fell. Why did the author, Matthew, want to tell us the darkness fell? What is so significant about darkness falling? I found the following in Moed Katan, and if you want the, the reference, it's Moed Katan, 25 page bet. Let's look at this together. It says this, Choshech al kol haaretz, gikan batalmul katuv. When Rabbi Yaakov, who was a great tzaddik, died, look what happened in the, the daytime. The stars were visible in the daytime. This is a very Jewish concept. And Matthew understood it. When a tzaddik is, is passing and it's a daytime and there's night, it's, it's, it's a picture of a tzaddika, of a tzaddik here. Now, notice what happened in the text. They offer him, they offer him a, a vinegar, okay? And as you'll see in a second, he, he took the vinegar, okay? In Matthew 27, 34, it actually says, let's go to the next one. It says, they offer him wine mixed with gold to drink, but after testing, he was unwilling to drink it. Initially, he was unwilling to drink it. But look what Metsudot David explained on this term. Let's look at the Hebrew together again. It says the same slide. It says, Ma'achilim oto esev marm mashkim oto chomet. They give him vinegar. The reason that you give vinegar to a person because you want to take the pain. This is a commentary, by the way, on the Psalms, that you want to take pain and to add pain upon the pain so he can suffer an extra suffering. Friends, the dipping of the parsley is a, dip, is a, is a, is a, is a dipping of redemption that we ask God to take the one who is like Yosef, Kutonet Pasim, who wore the garment that is stained with blood, and we say, we put all of these things upon him so that we may be redeemed. That is what this story really is all about here, friends, and I hope you all see that and understand what I'm explaining to you now. The dipping of the vinegar is significant. As a matter of fact, in Yohanan 19, we see kind of the, the cross-reference, and we read there, After this, when Yeshua knew that all things were now completed, to fulfill the scripture, he says, I need some air. I am thirsty. Now, a jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so the sponge soaked with the sour wine on a hyssop branch and brought it to his mouth. When Yeshua tested the sour wine, what is sour wine? It's called chometz in Hebrew. He said, 
it is finished. And he bestowed, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Please understood that this is very, very significant what Yeshua has done. And I want to give you a cross-reference if you have your Bible in the Tehillim. In Tehillim, chapter 69, okay, you're going to notice here a similar thing. It says in Tehillim, let me find, let me find. It's talking about the vinegar. And who is the one who is going to take the vinegar? Is Yosef. And why do we dip it? We dip it in order to pass, in essence, the role of the purification and sanctification, okay? To him, so he can rectify us back to the original garden condition okay so this is this is also a uh, very very significant and i hope you understand the importance of those things let me continue to go forward just for a moment we also eat during uh um Pesach, something that is called acharoset. It's a mixture of apples, and now we know what the apples represent, rectification of the first sin, but they also added, adding to it, always, in every dish, any Jewish dish, you add to the acharoset red wine. What is the red wine represent? Chazal spoke about this in one voice, and they say it's an illusion. It's an illusion to blood. It represents the blood, okay? And it says the following: When Eve ate from the forbidden fruit, from the tree of knowledge, she experienced. Listen to this: When Eve ate from the first fruit, she experienced her first blood cycle. Okay? She didn't have the things that. Women have to go today through Nida was not existent until Eve. So, ladies, you can thank Eve for this, okay? Therefore, we add the wine. In essence, we say, God, restore even those things back to its original condition. As a matter of fact, here is a page from Midrash Shochel Tov. I don't know if we have it for you or not. But there is a page from Shochel Tov that explain that there are three things that God is going to restore when Mashiach come. Okay? When the Lord, it says in Psalm 146, the Lord loosened the prisoner, the three things God is going to restore is one of them is the pig. The pig will be kosher again. But the other thing it says, Ein tom'ah Okay, there will be no more nida. Please understanding this, okay? No more nida. Because again, we are asking God, even in the true the car past, to restore the world, to restore us back to the original condition. So, you know, we went through a car past, we went through uh, uh, the, first, the first cup of Kiddush. You, you, you start to understand we are asking Mashiach ben Yosef, true Mashiach ben Yosef, to rectify us. But now we're getting kind of to the star, to the main event, the matzah. And what we do with the matzah is interesting. We have a, a white cloth and three matzot are covered in this. Okay? The middle matzah, okay, we are taking it out, okay? And basically, by the way, it's a reminder of the verse in Exodus 12, 34, if you want. So the people took the matzah before it was leavened. They, they, they took it and they wrapped it in their cloaks and their shoulders. That's Exodus 12, 34. That's kind of a, the, on the physical level. But what about the prophetic meaning behind this middle matzah, which is called also in Hebrew, afikoman? Why do we break the matzah? And why we, we, we also make this declaration, this is the bread of affliction. Why do we, we sing this song? Okay? 
This step has a specific name. It's called the yachatz. Okay, the yachatz is is also related to the word mechitza. And I always think about the Messiah. Tell us he's breaking the mechitza, the, the barrier. But what is the reason behind this breaking? Okay, let's go through a few reasons. And I want you to notice that when we break it, there are two pieces. One big and one small. And the big piece, it's very important, the big piece is the piece you're going to hide. Not the small piece, but the big piece. Okay? Why is it? Well, there's a few reasons that given by, the, by, by our sages. Let me run through them very quickly. Number one, it is a reminder that the tenth plague happened in the middle of the night. Therefore, we break the middle matzah into two unequal pieces because Moshe says, Thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go forward among the Egyptians. Moses said, Kechatzot, about midnight, not exactly midnight, since only God is capable to know in the exact moment of the event. The broken matzah is a reminder of human limitation. That's one reason. Another reason of the broken matzah is a reminder that God, of course, split the Red Sea. Similarly, similarly this, the Red Sea did not split equally, okay? It had two parts, and that's what it represents, okay? But there is deeper reason for this that I would like to get with you too. God divided also the years. That, the, that, that were mentioned as the covenant or uh, co covenant pieces into two unequal parts. Let me explain to you this. The people were subjugated by the Egyptian for slavery, according to Genesis 15, 13, for 400 years. But when we were enslaved, we were not enslaved for 410, 400 years. We were enslaved only 200 and, uh, 210 years. So too, the matzah is kind of dividing into larger and smaller pieces, okay? The larger piece is hidden under a pillow called a fikomen, and whoever finds it get great reward. We take out the middle matzah, break it into half, hide it in a place that a child will have to find it, okay? Now, I want to challenge you for a moment behind this thing, okay? The first night, this, this first part of, the first half of Matzah, Chazal explained, we represent actually an event that happened way before Moses. It's happening an event when Abraham went to, to, to help his, his, his brother, his brother-in-law, his nephew, Lot, okay, to set Lot uh, outside from captivity. That's the first piece of matzah. And the, during the second half of the night, God performed the miracle of the Passover. Chazal connected those two events from captivity to liberation to explain those two parts of matzah. And remember that when, when Moshe, when Israel left, in the wilderness, Moses called the altar, and he says the, call, the altar is called Adonai Nisi, called the place Adonai Nisi, which means God is my miracle. It's a reminder that miracles, that the miracles that happen in Egypt happen only through God's grace. We hide away the second, the, the second uh, piece, okay, uh, as the Midrash says, to the verse connected, it says, it was called, the, the, the it, it's uh, Exodus 12, 42, so it was for the Lord a night of watching, or in Hebrew it's called Lel Ashimurim. Lel Ashimurim is one of the names in Hebrew for the days when Messiah will come, okay? That means that we said about, about the bigger piece, because when Mashiach will come, the 
final redemption will be greater than the first redemption. Please understand, the redemption of Messiah will be greater than the, the redemption of Moshe. And that's why Chazal says it's absolutely imperative that the bigger peace will be set because it will be much greater than the miracles that we have seen, much greater than Mount Sinai and so forth. The future Geulah will be greater. And that is very important. Now, how do we get to this future Geula? You might ask the question. What is the steps? Well, the very first thing that we do in Pesach, when we take this, the, the matzah, we, we sing this song called Halachma Aniya. It's a Ramaic song. It's Halachma Aniya Deachalu Avatana Bireade Mitzrayim Kol Dichfin Yeteve Yechol. Everybody that is hungry, let him come. This is the bread of affliction that our father ate in the land of Egypt. Let us all who are hungry come and eat. Let us all who are needy come and celebrate. We, now we are one, we are, we are here, but next year we will be in the land of Israel. Now we are slave, but next year we may be free, okay? And interestingly enough, that represent the redemption, the, the bread of affliction represent the redemption. Okay, in some version of the Haggadah, I want you to notice something. The entire Haggadah, not this step, but the entire Haggadah, the entire storytelling before that, the first page starts with the word Ha Lachma Aniya. This is like the bread of affliction. It starts with this, which implies that the matzah that we are eating is not just similar to what our ancestors ate in Egypt. It's, it's not the actual bread they could consume, but it represents the same spiritual quantity as the bread that Hashem gave us. And matter of fact, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, okay, one of our famous greatest rabbi, explained the bread, the, 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 the bread of affliction in su such a, he said, matzah is more than just an imitation of the food of our ancestors who ate in Egypt. It, this is not what it is. It is not like the bread of the affliction of our ancestors that brought about the redemption and release from impurity. So to matzah has transformative power for us today. Matzah is food for healing. By eating it, we find redemption and a connection to the mighty one of Israel. The Zohar explained that because Israel ate supernatural bread, in Egypt, it was not a regular bread, please understand that. They were immune to the forces of evil called Yetzer Hara. Chametz, leaven, is likened to the evil inclination, okay? And by rejecting Chametz and only eating matzah that does not contain Chametz, the people of Israel were released from impurity, okay? all together and they were able to come so therefore they were able to consume chametz without the fear of having affecting them but you might ask the question wait a second if chametz is so bad okay and it's represent evil inclination why god allow it to be eaten at all why do we need it chazal explain it and answer this question with a parable and here is the parable to explain the power of the matzah. A king had only one child who became ill. At first, the doctor fed him only the special cure. But when he became better, he said the child could consume anything that he so desired. So too, when Israel went from Egypt, they had no idea of the source and the secret of their fate. God said, 
let the people eat only matzah, the bread of healing. While they do so, they should not consume any other food. When Yeshua gave the, the bread to his followers, he said, this is the bread of life, this is the bread of healing. While they do so, they should not consume anything else or any other food. Matzah will become the remedy to which they will enter the sick fate. After this, nothing can harm them so that they can again hit chametz. Matzah, in essence, allowed Israel to enter into the service of God in the divine, divine fate. This is why the bread is called the bread of healing or the bread of life and so forth. This, the bread of affliction, okay, is the, truly the bread of life. In matter of fact, the word here in Hebrew, the word an, 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 or ani, that's a word for affliction, okay, has different meaning, okay? It does not just mean afflicted, it does not even mean only poverty, but the word the word uh, ani comes from the word ane. Ane in Hebrew means answer, to answer me. It's literally called in Hebrew the, the, the bread of answers. And eating matzah made us ask many questions and offer many, many diverse answers. And I want you to get used to the fact that we're not going to get one answer, okay? But it's also called the bread of oni, of poverty, of poverty, because it's prepared in the way that a poor person prepares his bread. The word oni can also be de derived from this idea that we are to be blessed by Shefa, divine plenty. And how we receive divine plenty? From anything that comes from ab above, even if it's appealed to the world as oni. And a matter of fact, there is a clue here that as we take the bread and we eat the bread, our eyes open supernaturally to this bread of affliction. Look with me on these verses from Hosea chapter 2. And it says in Hosea 2.23, And it shall come to pass in that day, I will respond, says Adonai. Don't you like the word, I will respond? The word here, respond, in Hebrew is the word, E-N-E. E-N-E is derived from the word, only the affliction. How I will respond? I will respond through the bread of afflictions to the heavens, and they will respond to the earth. God, in essence, says that's how you are going to have relationship with me. It's through something that I will give you. It's an act of divine grace, okay? It was simply through the act of eating matzah that God redeemed us out of Egypt, and the next Geula, remember because it is cyclical, will be greater, with greater divine grace, okay, uh, than the first Geula, okay? In essence, we, he made us aware that there is no place empty of God's pl presence and God's grace and God's ca kindness. The Talmud explains it so beautifully and says it like this. An infant does not call his parents father and mother until he consume solid food. This means that wisdom and understanding come from God and only when become worthy of them through the food of healing. And how do we start? By receiving the gift of grace. Beloved, everything starts with the gift of grace. The message here is the message of grace. Matzah is called Lachma Aniyah, poor person bread. The lowest things, if it's come from Hashem, can and will provide grace. Let's continue on in the story of the Megid. One of the highlights in the story of the Megid is the story of four sons. Or as it seems, let's see a picture of those four sons. One of the sons is called in Hebrew the Chacham, which means the wise. One of them is called in Hebrew the wicked, 
one of them called the Tam, the Tamim, the Innocent, and one of them, Sheheno Yudel Lishol. He doesn't know how to ask. Now, what are those four sons? Who are those four sons? And what do they represent in terms of the Geula? I want you to pay attention with me for a moment. For first of all, the way that the blessing begins, and you can come back to me in the camera. It starts with the word Baruch HaMakom. You know, the, the blessing, before we describe those four children of Israel, we start with the prayer, Baruch HaMakom, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shenatan Torah Le'amo Yisrael, Baruch Hu. Blessed be the place, blessed be he, blessed is the one who gave Torah to his name, to people Israel, blessed be he. Four times the opening poem start with the word Baruch. And it starts with the word Baruch HaMakom, the place, okay? And it's four, why? Because it represents... Uh, the four children, you know, for the, for the same reason we do those things, you know, uh, it, they represent the Baruch before we eat, before we light Shabbat candle, etc., etc. Et Chazal explain that those four expressions, the Baruch, Baruch uh, uh, expression, uh, they, they represent the four cup of redemption. In essence, each one of those children has to be redeemed. And I want to shock you and explain to you something. Each one of those children is a story. We think only the wise one got redeemed, but that is not true. Each one of them gets redeemed in the story of the Agada. So let's talk about those children and see what we can learn about them. The first one is the wise is is the chacham is the wise child? The chacham. The question I hope all of you will ask yourself is what make him wise? Okay, why is he wise? And Chazal says he is not wise because he know all the commandments. This is a shocking answer, and I hope you understand it. He is not wise because he knows Hebrew, or he knows, or he knows uh, the, the, the reason for all of the comments. That's not why. Here is the reason the wise son is wise. He realized the reasoning for the commandment, and that they can be reduced to the fact, the simple fact, that God took us out of Egypt. Rather, he is wise because he is seeking to learn new mitzvahs and seeking knowledge that is brand new. That's the only reason that the, the wise son, the Chacham, is wise. He is seeking new things. That's what Chazal says. It's not about what he knows. It is about what he is willing to learn and what is desired to learn, okay? That's very important. Israel was, was redeemed from Egypt because they accepted two commandments. And even before that, the, the, the Torah was given. And what are the two commandments? The Pesach and the Brit. Okay, those were the two commandments. The Chacham is simply a Chacham, not because what he knows, but it's about his desire. And I hope everybody understands that. Your desire count, and the Torah wants us to know it, and the Chazal wanted to know it. Your desire to know Torah counts in the kingdom of God, even if you don't understand everything about Torah. Okay? The second son that I would like to talk about is... The wicked son, okay? What makes the son that is wicked, wicked? Here is the reason. Friend, he is wicked because he observes only a commandment that he knows the purpose and the reason for. And this is something I want to challenge us today in the body of Messiah to stop questioning everything the rabbi say or didn't say or find out the reason for everything. The wicked child, okay, what is he saying in the story? Why are you doing what you're doing? I want a reason. I want a report. I want to know why we're doing what we're doing. Friends, sometimes it's very dangerous to try to find the reason for every mitzvah. You know why? Because Hashem 
is heavenly and only he and he alone know the reason for every mitzvah we don't understand it and what makes the wicked child wicked is because he tried to reason and rational everything everything let us God help us so we will not be like the wicked the third son is the one who called the tamim the tamim the simple one and what does tamim will have to say he said, what is it, you know? The simple child is more impressed, in essence, with the natural universe than the Jewish history. He asked, what is the Exodus compared with God's greatness as creator of the universe? We tell this child, God took us out, of a, out in a strong end. In order to show the true greatness, God was even willing to forgo is Israel what Israel deserved, you know, in the interest of redeeming his children. That was more difficult than creating the world. The people of Israel were not worthy of being redeemed, friends. Please understand, understand it according to the principle of justice. Help, help us not to be like Atamim, impressed with the natural universe instead of the ancestry of our Jewish people. Okay? It's important to us to immerse ourselves in the Jewish culture and Jewish tradition and do things in the Jewish way. Okay? Very important. And actually, when we think about the four children, you think that the lowest one is the wicked one. Wrong! The child who is the lowest of the lowest of the lowest is actually not the wicked. It's the one that doesn't know how to ask. Why? Because he doesn't understand the way ancestors of avoiding chametz or the reason of facing or anything. He is lost. He's like a person who is lost in Egypt and became bogged down by idolatry. Only when we ourselves get rid of chametz, even inclination, we can even come to the point that we can ask. This child doesn't even know what to ask because he's stuck completely in Egypt. He is not start about, he did not even start his journey yet. Now, I want you to be understanding that all the story of the Geulah here is a story that all four children at the end of the day are getting redeemed. Okay, this is very, very important. Because we don't know who is getting redeemed. So two questions you have to ask yourself. Number one, how they're getting redeemed. Number two, are you ready for this? Who is the one who redeeming those children? Who is the redeemer of those children? Here you go. Pay attention to this very, very closely. The wicked person was redeemed because the covenantal promise of a redemption. And not because he was deserving redemption. God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To take the children out of Egypt after 400 years. And God did it. That's why he did it, even though he was undeserved. We call that friend grace. Okay? The one who didn't know how to ask was redeemed because the zechut avot, what called the zechut avot, the merits of the father. Because he chose to remain faithful to the tradition of the forefathers, even when he didn't all understood them. He merited redemption. Okay, the tell child, the, 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 the simple one, was also redeemed, okay, from Egypt because of the merits of the Torah, okay. Some of the people of Israel were redeemed not because what they did, because of what they would do in the future. He knew, Gashem knew that they would accept the Torah and therefore merited redemption even before redemption was deserved okay finally the wise one redeemed because he truly lived his life according to the Torah okay but the question become who is the redeemer of those four children and now we are finally getting to the important point the Torah speak about four children the Torah also talk about four cups of wine we also ask four questions and all of it is based on Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, 7, and 8. But there is a problem that I hope all of you are aware of. 
In Exodus 6, 6, he says, Lachan Amor Lebnei Israel, say to the children of Israel, I am Adonai, deliver you from the Egyptian, save you from your walk, redeem you in outstretched arm, take you to be my people. And then verse 8, something happened. And I brought you to the land. Wait a second, friends. There are no four children in this story. There is a fifth child in the story. There is one child who is missing from this story. And I want you to remember that there is the fifth cup of wine. The cup that we do not drink. Okay, it's the cup for Eliyahu and Avi. It's the fifth cup. So there are no four. There are five. But we don't drink this fifth cup. Why we don't drink this fifth cup? Because this son has not yet arrived. Who is this son? The word Echad, one. Shtaim, two. Shalosh, three. Arba, four. But the Chamesh, the fifth son, is rooted in his word. Look with me in the Hebrew. The word Chamesh is actually rooted, is the letter Chet Mem Shin, in the name Mem Shin Chet. Mashiach. Do you want to know who the fifth son is, friend? By the name five, we should know who it is. It is the Messiah. One of the sons will be the redeemer of the four other children. And who it is? It is the Messiah. And that's why, although the scripture says, and I will brought you to the land, and if you're in Israel, you're certainly in the land. You don't drink the fifth cup, but you're in the land. How can it be? It is because the fifth son yet to come. You might ask, where is the fifth son is? Well, the fifth son is in the diaspora. And a matter of fact, the sages tell us that the fifth son in the story of Pesach has a name. Has his name. He's the prodigal son. Some of you have heard the prodigal son story over and over again, but I promise you that you have never heard it through the story of the Haggadah. The prodigal son in the story is none other than the Mashiach. That's why we see in Luke 15 the following upon his return. This is again a prophetic picture of the story of Haggadah. It says, my son, the father said, you're always with me and everything. I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because the brother of yours was dead and he is alive again and he was lost and now he is found. Friend, the Chamesh, the fifth son, is the prodigal son. That's literally the name that is known as in Judah, is the prodigal son. And he is the one who is going to bring salvation to all the other sons. Notice he is a son of Israel. The Mashiach is one of the sons of Israel. He's not a Gentile. He's a son of Israel. He's a Jew. Okay? The other thing about him that I want you to notice, in Luke 15, it says that the son... The prodigal son appear wicked. He was wicked. We appear wicked. Yeshua appear wicked today, but he is not wicked. He is going to return. Look what the text says in Luke 15. Where did he went to? Where did the prodigal son son went to? It says that he went to the to other nations. He went to the goyim. Okay, he went to far lands to the nation. Yeshua today belonged to the nations, and only through these. This process of bringing back and inviting the fifth son back. I personally drinking the fifth cup, and I tell you why. I drinking because Yeshua, you know, Yeshua is representing this. That's why when 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 Yeshua was on the cross and say, maybe now we will bring Eliyahu. Why? Because what's the fifth cup? The fifth cup is the cup of Eliyahu and Avi. Okay, Eliyahu and Avi bring in the fifth. The, the, the ultimately the prodigal son, the Mashiach. So the story here of, of the four children coming down to this, all four children as being redeemed in the end, they are redeemed by the prodigal son. And who is the prodigal son? Mashiach Tzidkenu himself. 
Okay, one more thing for you. I realize that this is running quite long, this, this teaching, but I hope it's been a blessing to you. What about this funny song that we sing in the end of the Seder? Go like that. Chad Gad Ya, Chad Gad Ya, Chad Gad. Who is this Chad Gad Ya? The word Gdi in Hebrew comes from the word goat. It's the funniest and craziest story of this goat. And matter of fact, this story is, is a cursive story. What I mean is by a cursive story, we read one verse and then it's added to it another and then another, and we always sing it. And it's just a crazy story about a kid, okay? And a kid that is be, being ate by a cat, and a cat that did by a dog, and etc., etc. I want to read with you this crazy story as we understand what this story has to do with the future redemption of Israel. Here's the story of Chad Gadia, and I hope you will all sing it tomorrow. It's go like this. Then came the Holy One, that's the end of the story, blessed be he, and slaughtered the angel of death, who slaughtered the shochet. Shochet, if you don't know who the shochet is, he is the one who slaughtered. Who slaughtered the bull, that drank the water, that extinguished the fire, that burned the stick, that hit the dog, that beat the cat, and ate the kid, and one kid, one Kid, as a matter of fact, it's kind of end, the Chad Gadia is talking about, about the father who buy this story. Chad Gadia is one of the most uh, uh, known, well-known uh, 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 liturgy for, for the end. And it's the very end of, this, of the uh, Passover Seder. And the end of the story makes sense. God... Hamshem himself is the very end, in the very end of the story. He brings death upon the angel of death, okay? And if you want to understand how end time eschatology is going to look like, just see the end of the story. Hashem is going to defeat Ha-Satan, okay? The question becomes, what are all those things represent? What the kids represent, Okay? And what the cat represents, who is the dog, etc., etc. Various explanation is given to this. And they're all very messianic in nature. Okay? One explanation, one explanation explained that the kid is actually Yosef. Okay? Which the brothers soak in blood of the Gdi. The Gdi, the kid, is a picture of Yosef. The cat is these brothers. The dog is the Egyptian who brought, brought slavery upon the Israelite. The stick represents Moses, the first redemption of, over this Moses stuff. The smoke, the fire, represents the evil inclination, okay? The water represents the Torah, okay? And the, the, the story here, again, there is a bull. The bull represents, of course, the golden, the golden calf. A shochet, the one who slaughtered the golden calf, who beat the golden calf, is Moses, okay? And then the angel of death, etc., 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 and God redeem us. That's one way to look upon the story, but one of my favorite ways to look upon the story is true the words of one of our great rabbis, the Gaon of Vilna, okay. The Gaon of Vilna explained the story, the kid, okay, that the, the kid represents the Bechorah, the firstborn, okay. It's the argumentation to find out about the firstborn, okay, talking about Yo, kind of related to Yosef, but talking about from the beginning of the world, okay? All right? Now, the story continues with the fact that the father, okay, that, that the father bought the goat with two zuzim. If you don't know what two zuzim, it's, it's a gold coin, okay? And that represents Yaakov, who bought the birthright, Okay, of his brother. That's the beginning of the story, okay? They represented this. The story continue, you know, with the um the the soup that's representing in the story. The cat in the story represent again the sons of Jacob, okay, 
their jealousy of Yosef. But here's where it's become interesting. The dog is the kingdom of Egyptian. Remember, the four cups represent the four kingdoms of um, the four kingdoms before the final redemption. Okay, and then the dog which is come, you know, which represent the Egyptian, and then the stuff come after it in the story, remember? And the stuff kick it out. And what is the stuff? It's Moses' stuff, who parted the Red, Rice, the Red Sea. But then something happened. Fire come in the story. What that fire represent? Strange fire, according to the Gaon of Vilna. Okay, although Moses brought a redemption, their redemption was not a complete redemption. And Israel went together to Avodah Zarah. And then something happened. After that, water came. Water represent not just the spirit, but represent the rabbis themselves, who brought back a little bit the, the Jewish people away from Avodah Zarah. But then something happened. Oh, the bull appears. And who is the bull? Bull, bull to represent the kingdom of Rome, the kingdom of Christianity, according to this, to this story. Okay? But somebody coming and he's slaughtering the kingdom of Christianity. Who is the one that will do this? In the story, somebody slaughter the bull. Who is the one who is slaughtering the bull? It's called the story Ha Shochet. Who is the Shochet? The Shochet is Mashiach ben Yosef. He has to come, he has to fight for Israel, and he has to die, according to the story, by Malach HaMavet. Okay? But then something happened. After the Malach HaMavet kill him, HaKadosh Baruch Hu come, in, according to the Gaon of Vilna, in the manifestation of Mashiach ben David, and slay and slaughter Hasatan once and for all. And the rabbi says, no, it's not if we are good, we will receive ben David, and if we are bad, we will receive ben Yosef. No, they say ben Yosef has to appear before ben David will appear. So, okay, let me recap for you what we learned today very, very briefly. We learned a few things today, and I hope this has been uh, just a terrific study for you. Uh, I could take many more hours just going through this. But let me recap a couple of things that I hope will be very important as you conduct your seders and you think about the prophetic meaning behind this. The story that is called Haggadah is the story of connecting ourselves back to our original condition of re rectification with Hashem, may His name be blessed, back in the garden. All the elements are pointing us back to the garden. Okay, all of them. Moshe Rabbeinu, we're celebrating Moshe Rabbeinu and his exodus here for one purpose, so that we will have to be able to look for the next exodus, that's why it's called, this day called, according to Exodus 12, Yom Ashimurim, the day of watching, the day of watchmen, okay, in, 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 in essence. We're looking forward for these days, even to restore us back to the original condition, the way we eat, okay. That's why we declare Bore pre Adama, okay. And how do we achieve it? By double dipping. Immersion. What are we double dipping it in? We're double dipping it in vinegar. Why vinegar? Because the vinegar represents the karpas that we dip. The karpas come from the word pasim that represent the garment of Yosef. Only through Yosef, only what through Yosef done, through the blood in essence, we can take upon ourselves this rectification and prepare forward and that's why Chazal said we are to to do it twice first represent the scene of the children of Israel when we saw Yosef and maybe perhaps we need individually to do that too for selling Yeshua for who he's not 
Maybe it's something personal that you need to do. And the second dipping we do is for the future Geula as, as we are to do this, okay? Now, now we learn about the matzah, that this bigger piece of the matzah represent the future Geula, okay? And those is important because this piece represent the things to come. And that's why Chazal explained to us again that the second piece, the second piece will be much superior and more significant for the first piece. Remember also that according to Matthew 27, we learn that, that Yeshua drank this sour wine. This is important, friends. Yeshua is the representation, not just of the first cup, but he is also a representation of this vinegar. Put your trust in him, put your faith in him, and he is the one who can bring us down and bring us back to the power of resurrection. We also look at this, this, this principle of the four children, and each one of us is falling into the category of the four children, but it doesn't matter today if you are the wicked one or the wise one or the one that doesn't know how to ask or the innocent one. Here's what's important, that there is a fifth child that is waking, waiting. He is actually standing at the door where he wants to come in. He known in Jewish literature as the fifth son, Hamishi, or if you flip the letters, the term is Meshichi. He is the Mashiach himself. He is this prodigal son and he wants to return. And how is he return? He returned through this Lechem Oni, the bread of affliction. The word Oni Ani. Think about it. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 tell us the Mashiach is called Ani Rochev Al Chamor. How appropriate it is that the Messiah himself called Ani. He is called poor. The, the, he is a representative representation of this bread. The bread that give us answer. If you need answer, this is the time to call upon Mashiach to the bread of a affliction to this divine grace he is the only way that we can we can restore finally we look at this uh, song of the Chad Gadia and we learn through the Chad Gadia that although although the, the kid died and the cat died and the dog got notice all the kingdom died the angel of death also died because there was a shochet who is Mashiach ben Yosef who come Yeshua come far first time as Mashiach ben Yosef is coming then again according to the song as the, as, as the Holy One of Israel, Ben David, come to finally complete this salvation. I hope this lesson, this teaching, brief teaching on Haggadah, bless your heart. I, I hope you enjoy it. If God moving you to support this type of broadcast, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of time to prepare those type of teachings, to bring it to you. We always uh, uh, would appreciate greatly your support. But I would like to close just with a prayer for each one of you, Seder, tomorrow. Avinu Sheba Shemaim, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I ask that you give each person here who will lead tomorrow Passover Seder much tzlacha, much success, to see Yeshua in a unique way, but not just to see him, but to explain the message of the Messiah, of the gospel, the true gospel. Rectify and repairing and bring a tikkun to the world and tikkun to each person taking part of the seder, even back to rectify the sins of the Nachash, the serpent. So Lord, we ask that this will be a season of Nisim, is the word Nes derived from the, the term Nisan. Many miracles signs and wonders in every Passover Seder that is taking place. I ask this, Abba, in the name of your Son, Mashiach, Kenu Yeshua. Amen.